Well done, Mr. Woodard, under 10 minutes. Let's see how I do. We'll get through depressive disorders and schizophrenic disorders. A reminder, like Mr. Woodard was talking about with the term OCD, we have a tendency to use a lot of language um, without the same specificity as the DSM gives us. The DSM-5 is going to give us specifics on how to actually diagnose these particular ailments, so keep that in mind as we go through the next few slides. So depressive disorders, the first one to know is major depressive disorders. That's where we're going to get that feeling of sadness or loss of interest in activities. And then with that, there's also one called persistent depressive disorder. So this is a milder form of depression, but it lasts longer. So here's the key according to the DSM you're going to get a list of symptoms. And for someone to be diagnosed with major depressive disorder, you're gonna have five of these symptoms for a period of at least two weeks. Persistent depressive disorder is going to be just two of the symptoms for at least two years. So you can see here that the DSM is gonna be big on the number of symptoms and for how long they last. You'll see in this list of symptoms, as we saw in a previous video, we all can say, oh, I felt like that before, I felt like that before. It's when you start to compile several of these for a period of time. So unhappy mood, loss of interest in pleasurable activities. You usually love going on bike rides. Now you just don't even care. You don't even think about it. It doesn't sound good at all. Uh, significant changes in weight or sleep. Uh, changes in energy, this is kind of an interesting one with agitation, just kind of like feeling like you're always on edge or just being completely lethargic, not wanting to do anything. Some of the more intense feelings become those feelings of worthlessness or hopelessness, not being able to focus very well, really intense feelings uh, as we go into the recurrent thoughts of suicide and death, suicidal um, ideation withdrawal from social situations you don't even want to be around other folks or reduce sex drive now again remember you need several of these over a period of time in order to be diagnosed with one of the disorders that we mentioned at the top that's mentioned at the top of the slide there okay other depressive disorders to know premenstrual dysphoric disorder it's like premenstrual syndrome only on a heightened level so those mood changes the irritability the um, intense feelings those become even more intense than premenstrual syndrome disruptive mood dysregulation disorder this one i want to um point out to you must be before 10 when the, we start seeing the symptoms. This is something that's going to be in children and can carry through past uh, into the adolescent phase, but it has to be diagnosed disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. The onset has to be before 10. And this is where you start to get the temper outbursts at least three times a week. It, but there's a consistent or persistent irritability. There's always this kind of this feeling of anger and you don't know when the child is going to all of a sudden have that outburst of anger that he's been feeling and kind of harnessing um, for a while. Um, bipolar disorder, here's one that um, people have a tendency to you know, just throw around the term bipolar, but in, very important to know there are two types of bipolar. There's bipolar one and bipolar two. And you can see there that bipolar one, you're gonna get the more severe um, symptoms. Bipolar 2, hypomania, if you remember from your roots and stems, hypo means under. So with bipolar, you're going to get manic episodes and depressed episodes. And a good exa uh, example of this is we know somebody that has bipolar disorder. We know when she's going through, and she has bipolar 1, we know that she's going through one of her depressive episodes because we won't see her for literally a couple of months. Um, drive by our house completely dark at all times of day, just completely hunkered down, very, very depressed. Then all of a sudden, one day, we'll see her. She'll be out on the street. She'll be taking a walk. Um, she'll show up at our house. Hey, how's it going? And you can tell that she's moving out of that depressive zone into the um, manic. Now, um, just because she's excited and happy and she's out of that depressed state doesn't mean that she immediately goes into a manic state. 
but you can see a sense of relief and joy, and then it'll transition to a really heightened sense of mania. Now, bipolar 2, with that manic episode, it just won't be as severe as with the bipolar 1. So you might kind of stay on that elevated excitement level, but not go too extreme with the mania. Bipolar 2 can see um, uh, episodes of um, severe depression, um, but it's not going to be as severe normally as with bipolar 1. Okay, schizophrenic disorders. Now, again, with the DSM, it classifies, it has different chapters, basically, with different categories of disorders. And one of them is the schizophrenic disorders. So, of course, there's schizophrenia, which we'll talk about in a little bit more in a later video. You can see here, and remember, schizophrenia means split mind or split brain. So you get distortion in thoughts and perceptions. This is where you start to get your hallucinations and your delusions. We'll talk about that on the next video or on the next slide. Delusional disorder is one of the disorders under the, main, the big category of schizophrenic disorders. Delusional disorder is when you have at least a month of delusions, but you have no other psychotic symptom. Now, remember, difference between delusions and hallucinations. Delusions are beliefs. Hallucination, hallucinations are going to come through the senses. You actually smell something that's not there, or you hear something that's not there. So, so with schizophrenic disorders, according to the DSM, as somebody is diagnosing the different schizophrenic disorders, they're going to look for certain symptoms, how intense those symptoms are, and how long they last. So here are your main symptoms with schizophrenic disorders. Delusions, of course. Hallucinations. Disorganized speech. We'll watch a video in class with somebody that has this. Actually, there's a, several people on this particular clip that have disorganized speech. You, it's very, very difficult to follow their train of thought. They move from topic to topic very rapidly. Even when you ask them a question, they might start to kind of answer that question. But they're answering it in a way that is completely unexpected and um, really irrelevant. Uh, you'll get disorganized motor behavior, catatonia. I believe we showed a video of catatonia uh, in the states of consciousness unit. I think it was the states of consciousness unit. Or you'll get negative symptoms. Negative symptoms, this is like with reinforcement, positive and negative. Positive is adding something, negative is taking it away. So with negative symptoms, you're taking something away or you're withdrawing from social situations. You'll have the emotional withdrawal cognitive deficits all of a sudden things aren't really lining up as far as your cognition is concerned and so the deficits is that negative symptom um, you're not thinking clearly now what's interesting with schizophrenia is as they've tried to find possible causes of schizophrenia one thing that's not listed here is the uh, there's an epigenetic component so again there's that nature versus nurture well it's nature and nurture and with schizophrenia, they have found that um, certain genes need to get turned on before the symptoms of schizophrenia will, um, will manifest. So that, um, that environmental influence has to turn on the genetic influence that's already there. So genetics, abnormal brain structure, which I'll show you here in just a second. And then biochemistry, uh, there's a, a drug called Thorazine that's often used to treat schizophrenia. This helps with the negative symptom of not being able to think clearly. Thorazine helps the um, schizophrenic patient be able to think more clearly. There is a picture here, and I'll move mine up. There's a schizophrenia brain and then a healthy brain. What you're seeing here are what are called ventricles. We have these little cavities in our brains, and those cavities are filled with fluid, and they help the brain to kind of float around so it's not pressed up against itself pressed up against the skull. This actually helps us with, um, with um, impact in brain. We talk about concussions a lot. Those ventricles are there to soften the impact if we, if we get hit. It helps the brain, um, again, kind of float a little bit so it's not as compressed. Well, what they found in the schizophrenic brain is that, that a lot of the brain matter actually starts to waste away and the ventricles are enlarged. So you can see here the ventricles in the healthy brain are pretty thin. Here in the um, schizophrenic brain, they um, are much larger. And so some of that brain matter that does our thinking and our 
decision making, etc., is um, eroded. And lastly, here on this one, there's the diathesis stress hypothesis. This is what I was talking about with the epigenetics. So genetic, genetic factors place one at risk, but you need that environmental stressor to turn on the gene. So it might be a major stressor. It might be a major life event. It might be something that seems kind of innocuous, but it's stressful enough to the purpose to the individual that it flips on that gene. Okay, I'm just a little over 10 minutes. We'll send it over to Mr. Woodard.